life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Welcome back to Sunday of the Dead. Today we are talking about Season 3, Episode 3, Walk With Me. We are getting into these episodes. There's a lot happening in this one. At the same time, nothing happens in this episode. Well, yes, that is true. But what I will say is that this is one of the first episodes that does not feature anyone from Rick's group, Mm -hmm. with the exception of Andrea. Because it takes place entirely in Woodbury. Yeah, I I really enjoyed Woodbury when we first saw it. When we first watched the show, I was like, ooh, Woodbury. I like the way that this place thinks. Kind of. Kind of. No, nope, I don't like the way this this place thinks. No. Mm -mm. Uh, But anyway, let's go ahead and talk about some things about the broadcast of this episode. It first aired on AMC in October 28th. 2012. It was directed by Guy Furland. He is also going to be directing episode four, and uh, it was written by Evan Riley. When it was broadcast on October 28th, it was watched by an estimated 10.51 million viewers. Now, what's also weird about this title is that while this is called Walk With Me, the 12th episode of Walking Dead's 10th season was titled Walk With Us. And do you remember any, like, distinct ties between the two? I do not. I did not remember what Mm -hmm. happens there, but maybe we'll get there when we get there. Okay. All right. So in this episode, we open in a field, and we see a helicopter. And in this helicopter appears to be four guys, Mm -hmm. right? The the pilot calls Whiskey 1-2... And that's just military code, whiskey being the letter W, so it's W-12, mm-hmm. which could be his call sign. Okay. As the pilot is named Wells, uh, mm-hmm. and everybody calls him Wellsy. And the very first shot we get of him, we see his shoulder, and I like I had to work very hard to get a clear view of that patch on his shoulder. Mm-hmm. Because they are consistent throughout the rest of this episode telling you where he came from. He's from the Georgia National Guard, or what's left of it. And if you look, the patch that he has on is very close to the Georgia National Guard patch. It has a boar's head. But where the normal patch has two sheaves of wheat behind it, this one has two vertical bars. And I don't get what the difference is there. So on the helicopter itself, I can't see any overt symbols, although there is a call sign, and we'll talk about that a little later on. It looks like it is a U.S. Army helicopter. It crashes at 3481 Georgia 85 in Sonoya, Georgia. So I was able to map it. There is nothing there. It's basically a field. It looks like it's a farm right now. But where Andrea and Michonne are standing, they're kind of far off and they see the helicopter go down. They are at 515 Line Creek Road in Sonoya, and there is another farm over there. It's actually a 10-minute drive between where they're standing and where the helicopter crashes. But it's actually closer, and this is what, like, to me, a little weird. It's actually six to eight minute drive from where they filmed the prison at Raleigh Studios. (laughs) So if you were at the prison, theoretically, if you're going to go in a realistic world situation, if that helicopter actually crashed or it was supposed to crash, the people at the prison would see it better than Michonne and Andrea. And they could get to it faster if they cared. Right, exactly. For all we know, this might be actually taking place during some of the drama of one of the other episodes. Correct. They could be inside and, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever. Michonne is looking at that helicopter like she is both concerned and really pissed off. When I see this, I just think that life is much better with Michonne on screen. You just get that feeling of like someone that knows what she's doing. Mm-hmm. At this point, the group has Rick, who's on his way to being a good leader, but he's haunted by his family and Shane. Mm-hmm. You have Daryl, who's very capable, but reluctant to lead because he's haunted by his family. Then you have Carol, Maggie, and Glenn that, that are on their way, but Michonne... She's not only dealt with her haunted family, she's put them to work for her and that's by actually, being her pet. That's a really good point because when you think of Michonne, not only do you feel safe because she can obviously, you know, kick your butt, 
But on top of that, she is smart and she, you know, as she does in this episode and the next episode, really sits there and tries to analyze the situation, can see through the lines of whatever people are trying to throw at her and can call when they are lying. Oh, yeah. She is just all around an amazing person. And one of the things that I did notice in this scene is that her wing spooks aren't just there as zombie deterrent. Mm-hmm. she's also using them to carry all of her bags. Right, so in a, they're pack in mules. a bad situation, she can just drop the chains and fight. But one of the other things that I noticed there is that one of them is carrying the OG gun bag from episode one that Andrea had been carrying around at the end of season two. When, when she left the farm? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. The intro pops up as we see Andrea and Michonne ambling their way towards the helicopter crash. When they get there, Andrea sees the copter and then throws up, mostly because she's still sick. Mm -hmm. And then Michonne padlocks her walker pets to the tree and offers to go check out the copter. So as she goes over there, she notices that one of the guys has his lower body, like completely separated from his upper body. And you can see that the rotor for the helicopter is just a little bit away, and there's a gouge in between him and the rotor blade. So that helicopter done ended him. Right. And then off in the distance, she sees some trucks that are coming. And so she jumps back over to where Andrea is and hides behind the bushes. But at the same time, the walkers are starting to come out because they hear the commotion. So they're coming out to the copter and the men in the trucks are trying to kill them. But then after they've done that, the men in the truck see that there might be someone alive inside the helicopter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's really funny at this point is we see how effective the walker pets really are because a walker comes out of the forest and walks literally right by Andrea and Michonne because the walker pets are right there. So they just amble on like, no, no, no big deal, right? Mm-hmm. Andrea and Michonne continue to watch what's going on because they're trying to figure out what is happening. Who are these guys, right? Also, the walker pets start making a little too much noise. They start getting a little too excited about things that are happening. And I find this really weird because when this whole thing first started with these other guys that walked up, the wing spooks were pretty docile. Like, they aren't doing anything. They're just like... Right. But then as these guys went around and started killing more of the zombies, they started to get more and more riled up. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's partially because they're making a lot of angriness, but mm-hmm. we didn't actually see their death and how long it took them to reanimate. My theory is that these are actually also smart zombies, but it's not like it's going to matter too much longer. Well, I think later on we find out exactly who these walkers are. Yeah. And when they start to make noise, Michonne tears them down, like basically kills them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we're watching this episode, we don't really think much about that because we're like, okay, well, you know, she'll just get some more. But then later on down the line, when you really start to figure out who these walkers are, which we don't find out for seasons, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like in this moment, she was just stronger than I would have been in this in this moment. She did it like there wasn't a thought in her brain. She knew what she had to do and she had to do it. They're, they are her family, but who they are exactly when you see the backstory. Wow. Yeah. So the men are starting to leave the helicopter area, but all of a sudden you hear a voice behind Andrea and Michonne. And I knew, like I had forgotten that this is where it happens. But as soon as I heard that voice, I was like, yes. It is Merle. Definitely Merle is back and people were actually really excited to see him back because he is such a dynamic character. Whether you love him or hate him or, you know, hate that he's racist or whatever, he's just a very interesting character that provides a lot of light to the situation. And by light, I mean excitement, humor. There we go. Yeah, Michael Rooker is a geek staple he was in Kevin Smith's Small Rats, Guardians of the Galaxy. He showed up in What If, and he was also in Suicide Squad. And like Denai Guerrero, he was also reprised his role of Merle in Robot Chicken. That's amazing. So now we see though that Merle has a prosthetic arm. It is made of fiberglass and it's painted to look like aged metal. He has a couple little things that are on the end of his arm. We'll talk about that later. But one of the things that Merle or Michael Roker has said is that he considers Merle's entire body to be a weapon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So he considers himself a tank. At this point, Andrea faints either because she thinks she's seen a ghost or because she's sick or both. Yeah. And Michonne just looks like she's super ticked. 
about the whole situation. She spends a lot of time angry looking in right. the first few episodes. Andrea is kind of coming to in a truck. And the voice on the radio in the truck tells Milton, and Milton is the guy who's in the truck with them, right? No, they're actually talking to Milton over the radio. The guy oh, who's gotcha. talking right. is the guy who has been leading the group of on, that's on the truck. Right. So that guy tells Milton that he has a homework assignment and needs to open the lab. So Dallas Roberts playing Milton Mamet. I first saw Dallas Roberts as the legendary producer Sam Phillips in... Asking Johnny Cash what song he would be his legacy. And what is that? In Walk, in Walk the Line. In Walk the Line, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. He played as uh, Sam Phillips. And he was also in a great but short-lived AMC spy series called Rubicon. The other roles that he was in, he was in The L Word. He was in The Good Wife. And he was in one of Lainey's things, a Netflix yes. uh, pageant series called Insatiable. Yes, he is. He plays this, like, southern. It's totally separate from what he is doing here. He plays this like Southern pageant coach. I honestly, when I first started watching, I did not recognize him at all. Hmm. This is a sign of a good actor. Right. So Andrea can kind of see out under her blindfold and she can see that outside the truck, there is a guy already hung by a tree. And there's also a guy with a gun. She utters a name and that name is Michonne, which is the first time her name is spoken at all. Yeah. Total. So we have seen her the first time, the last episode of season two, and now here we are, three episodes later. Finally, we know her name. And then she sees Merle. And when he looks down, he seems to realize she can see through her blindfold, and he covers up her eyes again. And he's like, shh. Like, yeah, I know you can kind of see some of this, and that's okay. (laughs) Andrea wakes up in the infirmary, and she's being looked at by a doctor. Donzely Abernathy as Dr. Stevens is known for her roles in NCIS, Suits, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Oh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. That's where I know her from, too. Yes. So Andrea wants to know where they are, and the doctor says it's not for her to say. Then Merle comes in and tells the doctor to go look at the other patient, which we know is the helicopter pilot. Merle reveals that the group was the ones who found him after he escaped from the roof and lost his hand. About 13 minutes in, when Merle is seated and talking to Michonne and Andrea in the infirmary, he can briefly be seen with a fully functional right hand. A strap on his right arm can be seen, but the prosthetic is not there. Later on in the next shot, it is restored. I did see this. It's very brief, but you have to be looking for it. And I was like, whoa. Phantom hand syndrome. (laughs) Andrea catches Merle up on who is with them, who is no longer with them, and who died that was in the group. And when she mentions Amy, Merle is actually looking at her really sympathetically. Probably because he kind of also feels for perhaps the loss of his own brother, the separation from his own brother. Mm -hmm. He understands that. It's kind of weird seeing Merle be sympathetic with people. I think, though, of all the people, Merle probably was okay with Andrea because even though Merle was a little crasser, Andrea can deal with it. I mean, she dealt with Shane. So I'm guessing she probably was like tolerant at least of Merle but they do have that connection now where she says that she knows what it's like to be left behind because she Mm -hmm. feels like that's what happened at the farm they didn't come back for her so now she's quote unquote left behind there in the room with them are also two guards their names are Shrupert and Crowley Andrea says thank you to Merle and Michonne looks at her like she is absolutely crazy. Like, why are you thinking him right now? Enter the governor. Yeah, this is played by David, David Morrissey. Yeah, yeah David, David Morrissey. Morrissey has some serious nerd cred. He was been in Good Omens, which we really enjoyed. And he was also a kind of fake doctor in Doctor Who? Opposing <laughs> doctor? Apparently, Michonne and Andrea do not know what happens when you die. And that everybody has the virus. They don't know this yet. Yeah, but it does seem like now... Since they get brought up to speed, the people at Woodbury do know this. Well, yeah, they would have observed this already. Because Andrea also wasn't there when Rick told the rest of the group Mm -hmm. that's what he had learned at the CDC. The governor tells them they can stay the night, but they don't open the gates when it's dark. That's just safety protocol. He's welcoming and he's prepared to fully stock them up if they want to leave. He's even offering them a vehicle. Yeah. Which is pretty generous. But since we kind of know this character a little bit, we also know this is possibly a manipulation. Right. It's making himself look generous. Yes. 
Super Trooper Charming Guy. Mm-hmm. So then we actually get to see what Woodbury looks like. So first off, they are in the main street of Sonoya. I had a super fun time, probably for like a good hour, just looking at Google Maps and seeing everything that is currently in Sonoya on Main Street and everything that correlates to these shots. And there are things that are still there and yeah. there are things that are not. It was about a three minute drive from Woodbury to the crash site of the helicopter. So it makes sense that they arrived Pretty very quick. quickly. So if you're wondering about the timing on that, totally plausible. They reused the city when they filmed Alexandria as well. They just didn't use the main street part for Alexandria. They used other parts of Sonoya. So you can't totally see that it is the same city. They did, mm-hmm. a, they did a really good job of like redressing it up. As they're walking past, you can see the Woodbury Cafe. This is now McMaster's Barbecue and Catering, the Sonoya Coffee and Cafe. Those are in the corner of this building. It looks like there's quite a few buildings that have multiple things in it, like a co-op or a marketplace. There's also the French Market Antiques and Interiors that we see there, which is now the Fox Hollow Antiques. And you can see this sign that leads me to believe that maybe there are two different antiques and that one, that Fox Hollow is the real one that's still there and that French Market either was added or is also there inside the same marketplace. I couldn't tell. There is a wall that's built at the end of Main Street parallel to Travis Street, and that's their main gate. That's how they get into Woodbury from everywhere else. It's where they have the most amount of guards stationed and all of those trucks and... Well, also what I'm seeing there, the wall is made out of like aluminum siding mm-hmm. that is backed with truck trailers. They're using the trucks as the actual weight and support. And even then, those trucks are stacked with truck tires to give them even more weight. And then they're using the aluminum siding as the actual wall. The only way you can get this any better is to just layer a bunch of dirt back there and make it into a palisade. Mm -hmm. But it's a super smart use for scavenged materials. The other thing that we see here is that they're using bonfire to light during the night. And while it's really, you know, it makes logical sense, everything here has this kind of a hellish color to it. Have you noticed that? Like, it just feels like they just walked right into hell. Well, yeah, because when we find out, like, in a couple episodes what they actually do at night, some of their nighttime activities, this is totally appropriate. Yeah. And then as they're kind of walking, Governor says to uh, Andrea that he would rather die then sacrifice the safety of Woodbury. And this shot kind of hangs on him ominously and foreshadows that later on, he literally ends up killing anyone that won't help him get revenge. Mm -hmm. So as we continue part of the tour, Merle is kind of with them as well. And we notice that he refers to the walkers as creepers. But Andrew and Michonne are pretty much done that things are so nicely guarded. It seems so safe there. Mm -hmm. Then... They start to shoot a group of walkers that are kind of walking their way to the wall. And then the governor starts to take them down the street to a house to stay for the night. And when you get in there, you see all these cables that are running down from the ceiling down to the switches. It seems like they've retrofitted the entire place for solar power. And we do see solar panels that are sitting out in the middle of the street. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting how they've refitted everything to be their new power system. As they're kind of like talking, he's like giving them everything that they need to get started. The governor sounds really charming, but there's something hidden in the way that he talks that just screams of white male privilege. And Andrea just keeps on responding with thank yous like she's conditioned to it. And that's why Michonne keeps giving her the stank eye every time she does. (laughs) Because it's these white guys that are being like, well, I'm doing something nice for you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> she like turned into Carol all of a sudden. Like yeah. Season one Carol. Yeah, exactly. Well, the next morning on Woodbury, there seems to be dogs. They're like all over the place. Like we don't see dogs very often except for later on when we get to dog. Daryl's dog, dog. Dog. And there seems to be a bunch of dogs. There are solar panels, as we mentioned. There's an herb garden in the middle of the road. As they're walking along, there's a gray building on the right. It's the Sonoya Masonic Lodge. Even in this really small town in Georgia, there's a Masonic Lodge. There is a tour guide that says there are 73 people that live in Woodbury with one on the way because someone's pregnant. I have to say here that I'm actually really excited to 
to go and visit this town because it looks super cute. Yeah. It was like the type of town that you would just want to, you know, chill out, sitting on the sidewalk with your ice cream, just watching the people go by. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Behind Michonne is a store called Beyond the Door. Yes, this still exists. Kind of. The sign is still there on it, but the store itself closed in October of 2020. And it they didn't even change the the outside of it. it it's... Huh. It's a real store called Behind the Door, or was. Now we're going to go back to the infirmary and visit the pilot they pulled out of the helicopter, who was with the doctor. He is telling them that their camp was overrun with walkers and they escaped. There were 10 men in his group, but they got stopped by the freeway. And that is when they took the helicopter up to get away. So if there were 10 men and there were four of them in the helicopter, that means there are six Somewhere else. Yeah. So the governor offers to find the other guys and promises that he is going to bring them back. And if you look on the whiteboard behind them, the whiteboard is just filled with writing. And the only words that I can make out is MRCA, which either means magnetic resonance coronary angiopathy, which I don't think that they have access to in this tiny town, or multi-role combat aircraft, which would be the helicopter. So... Is it possible that they're using this whiteboard right next to the guy to keep notes on all the things that he's saying so that they could go and find these no people? No idea. No idea whatsoever. The governor then goes to a lab where Milton and Merle are working, and he asks about Andrea. Mostly because I think he wants to get information out of Merle, because Merle has a connection with Andrea, and he's trying to get more insider information. Milton is looking at Michonne's pets and what how they work. So he says, if you take away their ability to eat, they become lurkers, which we actually talked about when Herschel's leg got bit, that mm -hmm. there is such a thing as these lurkers, right? Who kind of stay in like a dead like stasis Torpor, yeah. until something wakes them and then they like... Yeah, like sleep mode, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. He says, walk with the biters. They think you are a biter. So this is the same theory they do in this show and also a Fear the Walking Dead with either smearing your guts on you or using walker skin as a mask. You know, we're, we're going to see this multiple times throughout all of the different Walking Dead series. I have to say, though, if I were going to choose which one I would do, it would be walker pets, number one. Yeah. Skin mask, number two. And the smearing of the guests, number three. How about you guys? I'm, I'm with you on that because at least the walker pets, you get to have pack mules. I would might flip the guts and the ass just because I would not want it on my face. It would be kind of gross and stanky. One of the things that the governor says as they're kind of as they're talking, he's like trying to impose logic on the chaos. And I'm just thinking of all this time that we've sat here trying to figure out the smart zombie f stuff from the first two seasons, it felt like we were trying to impose logic on the chaos. Yeah, well, that's what we do. <laughs> that's what we do. We overthink things. <laughs> there is also a small-scale Woodbury model there, which is super impressive. Yeah. Somebody spent some time on that. Governor says he needs Milton and his tea. Now, as a tea lover, as y'all know, I love my tea. In fact, right now I'm drinking some Good & Gather Mint. Yes. Okay. What kind of tea is this that Milton is making? I'm intrigued. They are seemingly obsessed with it here in this. Like, maybe it's just because it's a taste of civility, and that's why they're all about it. But or there's something in it. I honestly can't remember. I don't remember. Um, yeah, I, I mean, tea is one of those things that can be completely healing. It could also be hallucinogenic. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know it this way. So then we go to the governor's house where Milton, Andrea, Michonne, and the governor are having breakfast. It looks like they're having eggs and toast and, of course, some tea. Although we don't know what type of tea they're drinking yet, there is a pretty little teacup set. And he has a tea steeper. Now, one thing about this that I noticed, when, he, when Milton went to go pour the tea, the water level in the tea steeper did not go down. So I don't know that they were really actually using the tea that was in this tea steeper or not, but I should know because I have one exactly like it. And basically what it is, is you put the tea, the loose tea inside this pitcher with your hot water and you let it just steep for a little while. And then you take the pitcher and you place it on the top of your teacup and on the bottom of it, it's like plugged up, but there's like a plastic like plate. And when it hits the top of your teacup, it shoves itself up into 
the pitcher itself so the tea water part will drain into your cup but the tea leaves stay above a mesh mm -hmm. so that you aren't drinking your tea leaves so that's how come i could tell pretty much because if it was being used then the water level would be going down into the teacup i don't know it's an amazing thing i love it for loose tea because you just yeah yes it's great this has been tea talk with laney that's right. Not sponsored. Wish I was. Michonne is eyeballing her katana, which is over in like a display closet, like mm -hmm. across the room. Milton asks Andrea if she thinks the walkers remember anything of their former selves. She says she doesn't think about it, but they learned at the CDC that the part of the brain responsible for memory and cognitive thought doesn't return when the dead return. We already know this, so technically she should know the answer to this. But I don't think she really wants to think about that time. Like, she, she literally says she doesn't think about it because she doesn't want to. Mm -hmm. Also, she kind of wants to keep her cards close to her chest as to how much she actually knows. If she goes off and says, yeah, well, I was at the CDC and they said this and this and this, they'll be like... Oh, right. What do you really know? Right, exactly. That's true. So Milton wonders if Michonne knew the actual pets. We find out later she does, but of course she's not going to say anything about it now. During the conversation about how they are surviving, the governor says that they are the seed. So this is the title of the first episode mm -hmm. of this season. We didn't really talk about that. So how do the two connect? How are they the seed this is the beginning of the rebirth of society both here at woodbury that's what he wants to do and at the prison they aren't really trying to do that but we do see before things go horribly wrong they're very close to getting to that point at mm -hmm. the prison right milton asks andrea if she likes the tea He's a tad obsessed about the tea. Do you like the tea? Do you, do you like the tea? <laughs> milton and i are tea bros obviously Michonne is very suspicious of the whole situation, like normal. Very suspicious. And the other thing that I noticed here is, because I'm just paying attention to the governor a lot here, he emphasizes command words when he talks. Mm. So when he said the word relax, that is the word out of everything that got emphasis. So he, Michonne is picking up on how, despite his charisma, he has this hidden agenda in keeping them there because he's trying to make them relax so obviously she's seen the movie now you see me you know because they go relax and then yeah which is not how <laughs> hypnosis actually works but you can you can emphasize certain things to make it stand out more in right. people's minds so let's go back outside and see woodbury a little more shall we andrew and michonne are walking in front of the main street fudge and ice cream shop this building is also home to cobblestone market which is permanently closed a dentist office that's above the ice cream store, which I feel like is really funny. That's like, where you go. Eat the ice cream, get your teeth fixed. You know? <laughs> There's also McGuire's Irish Pub, a bookkeeping service called Journals and Ledgers, which I think is completely brilliant. And in this building is the Walking Dead Woodbury Shop, <sighs> uh, which obviously is not being shown, but it does exist. So what this is, is the owners and the creator of the graphic novel and the executive producer of the show robert kirkman the executive producer david albert and the former ridgewood studios co-owner scott tickler tickler and shop executive manager brian jack so they filled this store with items like signed photos cardboard cutouts and officially licensed products there's even a small museum of props from the set downstairs and the Walking Dead Cafe. I shudder to think what they're going to serve there, but I am intrigued. Tea. <laughs> yeah, probably tea. tea. Atlanta movie tours also leave from this location. Who's excited? Who wants to go that, visit? That sounds that? really fun. Yes. I mean, they're probably going to jack up the prices a lot, but you know what? It's going to be fun to visit at least. Correct. So I was trying to see this necklace. I, You know, I have a thing about what people are wearing. So I saw Michonne was wearing a gold necklace, but I couldn't quite see what it was. Marshall, tell me about it. Well, I actually saw that like in the hospital sequence. I was like, "What? where is that necklace? It's a golden cursive letter M. It's for her own name. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. But Andrea is trying to convince Michonne to stay in Woodbury. As they're having this conversation, Michonne is standing in front of a window that has a schedule of the town hall meetings, which mm -hmm. is interesting. There is another building. I think I figured out that the name of the store is called the Queen's Jewels 2. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I looked it up a little bit there. It's basically a jewelry store. Yeah. You noticed that there was an antique store and a bicycle shop, right? That's around there also? Yeah, but this was also the point where we started to realize that Google Maps changed all the photos. Right. So one day I looked at it and the store that they're standing in front of had a sign with a skull and crossbones on it. So I had Marshall look at it and then the next day I came back and it was a completely different picture. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> It's a cover-up. Andrea is saying she hardly knows Michonne, even though they have been together for like eight or nine months. I don't necessarily feel that she's being truthful here because for some of those Atlanta people, she was not with them for that long and she had to trust them. So I feel like she's just taking a cop out at this moment. But it also does take a long time for Michonne to trust people. So Michonne is kind of closed off for a while until... She trusts you. And so that's probably what's happening in this situation also. When they're talking, Andrea makes a comment about how easy it probably was to kill those you know, wing spooks. And Michonne's lips tremble when she says it was easier than you think. So, yes, she did what had to be done. But in the long run, this hurt her because she knew them. Mm-hmm. They were very close to her. And this entire conversation with Michonne is has her eye on her other reason for mistrusting this place because there's this guy in the background that has been lurking in the background the entire episode ever since they got taken to their temporary apartment he's been sitting outside there watching them and i think it's crawley i think his name is crawley yeah and he's been sitting there and he's got his hand on his knife never took his hand off his knife the entire time so obviously there's something more than just a oh he's there to help you no now we're gonna go to the army camp because the governor is going to go check out these guys the military camp is at 646 rising star road in sonoya it is also a farm (laughs) the car drives up and the governor is kind of waving a white handkerchief like a white flag he is the only one in the car And he says, well, we have Lieutenant Wells. So he immediately tries to make that connection with them by saying, we have this person, we know his name. And then he just starts to take out the soldiers. We're going to start doing a body tally count because obviously he's killing the living here. So we're going to start adding this to our count. So the... The thing about this is because we really have no way of knowing like who is killing whom at this point because his men step out and start joining him to shoot. We are only going to count the governors. We see him shoot two people. Mm -hmm. And then everyone else that he was hidden, they step out and start killing everyone else. He takes the gun from the first guy he shoots. He hits the soldier a few times with the butt of the gun. And then he sees a guy running away and shoots him again. So that leaves the tally to three. Mm -hmm. Then they proceed to loot the camp. So I want to open up a question for both of you. What is his motive? I think he sees them as a threat because they're, you know, they've got tactical probably superiority on him. I mean, although he's proven himself in the apocalypse, I just think he's worried that somebody, that there might be some kind of coup in the future with these guys because they have their own line of thinking because they're military. I kind of feel like on the same boat, like he, he has all the manpower that he needs to do things, but those people are loyal to him. These other military guys have power, but as soon as he brings them into the group, they're not going to listen to him. So he he basically only preys on people who he thinks are weak minded that he can control. Yeah, and he kills everybody else, and he takes their equipment. Which is weird, because I don't really see Merle as being weak-minded, but, you know, he's there. He was somebody that was basically a wounded dog. He could get that dog to love him by taking care of them. He knows that. Mm -hmm. Well, back in Woodbury, they are bringing back the bounty of their massacre. (laughs) They're driving those tanks straight down the street. Pan over to Michonne. Still looking skeptical and concerned. And the governor stands up on one of the tanks and makes a speech. And he claims the army camp was ambushed by walkers. Lie, but only kind of. It was at one point ambushed by walkers. But that is not what killed them. Yes. Also, he uses this incident to enforce that Woodbury's walls are what keep people safe and discourages people from leaving. He's trying to be like, oh, don't go away because, well, this is where you're safe. You can't be safe anywhere else because right. this is what happened to these guys. 
Morrissey actually studied cult leaders Jim Jones and David Koresh for influences in acting out the governor. Also, Bill Clinton. <laughs> That's but awesome. only for his accent. Right, right. <laughs> so I found this thing online and Marshall said he wasn't able to see this. But I was. So I'm going to tell you about it. You can make your own determination whether this was intentional or not. As he is doing this whole big speech, there is a foreshadowing of the governor's eye patch that he will eventually get. And it's over his left hand eye. So as he notifies the residents about the fate of the military convoy, there is a shadow that casts across his left eye and kind of in the shape of a triangle. Yes, I did see it. Is it intentional? I have no idea, but it's pretty interesting if you look for it. So there's a little hidden thing there. But as we're there talking, the governor is talking, Andrea is getting more and more enamored with the idea of this town working, that this is an actual community that people can actually live Mm -hmm. in a safe place. Andrea wants to ask the governor his real name. And he says that he will never tell her his real name, which is a lie because he does it in the next episode, but whatever. And then because he never tells people his real name, they are forced to call him the governor. That this is the first instance of civilization that we see in the apocalypse. The rest Mm -hmm. of it is kind of run and gun and throw it together as you go with the other group. But this is the first time we see that. It's not just a single residence. It's a lot of different families coming together. And yes, we're going to see this a lot more in in the future. We're going to see this in Alexandria, in the hilltop, in Sanctuary, in the kingdom, in Oceanside. Like these places are going to start popping up a lot more. But this is really the first that we see that's like that hopefulness of, of having a community. You do kind of need to have a minimum amount of people to have a viable sediment settlement Mm -hmm. if you have too few people you don't have enough people to keep you secure to be able to thrive you can only survive right it's night now and we're at the governor's house and he is getting out of bed there is a, a woman in his bed we don't know who it is the governor revealed that he lost his wife in a car accident before the apocalypse happened so we never actually see her on screen But he does keep a family photo in his Woodbury home on the mantle. And so the camera at this point will pan to this picture. And the woman portraying his wife is Walking Dead co-executive producer Denise Huff, Hmm. which I thought was hysterical. The clock by the picture says 930. Still not aligning with the whole episode season. Mm -hmm. But yes, 930 at night seems appropriate. Around his neck, he wears a key. And this key opens up a locked room for good reason that it's locked. It's his study and it has many aquariums with the heads of walkers in it. Now, this is like something that really shocked a lot of people. Not not only were they not really like ready for it, but also the disgusting perversity of keeping these walker heads in water like as a wall of aquarium, almost watching it like it's TV is weird. But then you can sit there and think about, you know, we do the same thing. Only our walker heads are in TVs, but whatever. Uh, So a little bit about how they did this. So in an interview with Kevin Smith, Greg Nicotero revealed that one of the floating heads in the governor's fish tanks was a recreation of Ben Gardner's head in Jaws. Yes. Yeah. Ben's head famously popped out of a hole in his fishing boat after he was attacked by the great white shark. It's one of the biggest jump scares. It's actually probably the first jump scare in the movie. There are 24 of these prop heads, and they are secured to the bottom of the tanks. They were hollowed out, which allowed them to float. The water was colored a sickly yellow by adding coffee grounds, tea, and dye. I noticed that on the top right are the two pets of Michonne. So they had gone and gotten them, apparently. At the very, very top is the pilot that they rescued, quote-unquote. Obviously... They killed him. So that makes the the governor's body count four. Mm-hmm. But was it, doesn't that make, aren't all of the heads in there the ones that he's killed? Yes, but we don't know that he kills the living. That's what we're counting. We're oh, not, okay. We are not sure if those people were alive or dead when they died. So I can't count that. We can only do what we see. Yeah. So what I what I see when I look at this is that he's using this as trophies. 
Like this is while he claims that, like this is a way of hardening himself against the harsh realities of the apocalypse. All of these are people that he's killed, mm-hmm. or they are markers of people that he has conquered. This is just him building up his own ego. Right. I totally agree with you. I think they're like I said, they're trophies. It's like watching your entertainment on TV. Let's talk about the title, Walk With Me. Why don't you guys tell me your interpretations of what you think that this means? There's a literal interpretation, so there's also a deep one. What do you guys think? Well, it's kind of like the governor kind of recruiting people. So it's a recruitment phrase, uh, walk with me. But it's also a literal, they spend a lot of this episode kind of walking up and down Woodbury, Mm -hmm. uh, including with a tour guide. So yeah, this is a literal one. Also, this is, we we know Woodbury is not going to last. Many of these people are going to die. Walk with me. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I also wanted to talk about one more thing, and that is that we have the governor who builds a society and he makes himself basically the king of his society. The same happens with Ezekiel. He makes himself the king of the kingdom. What is the difference between, in approaches, between the governor and Ezekiel that you see? With King Ezekiel, I think part of why he names himself king is just a th- his theatrical side. I don't think it's so much to puff him up as it's just a f- like a fun way to approach being the leader. But with the governor, it's it's all of his ego of wanting to be the top and be the one that's respected. But yeah, with Ezekiel, I think it's just kind of like a personality thing with him. As far as what I've seen, Ezekiel's whole story, yeah, he did kind of start some of the legend about himself especially when he's got this tiger that's with him and he doesn't correct anybody but he isn't constantly building up this legend to try and make himself and his own agendas work Mm -hmm. he he just allows people to let it go away from them the governor is constantly (laughs) throwing lies onto the fire Mm -hmm. to try and keep people doing what he wants it's a big difference of intent he governor wants power Ezekiel really wants to keep people together. I agree with both. One last thing I want to talk about the comic connection. I didn't talk about this last week. In chapter four, the heart's desire in the comics, Michonne reveals that her pets are her boyfriend and his best friend. And then some of the differences is she actually meets the group, meaning Rick's group, uh, when she comes up to the prison and starts helping kill. They end up telling her that she can stay there without the sword or her pets, and that's when she cuts the heads off her walker pets. Uh, Just a side note, too, that I will no longer be covering the comic book part of this because I just got really overwhelmed with everything else I have to read. So maybe sometime down the line, Corey will take up the mantle of the comics, but that is pretty much all I'm going to do for that. And that is our episode three of season three of The Walking Dead. Walk with me. Uh, Tune in next week. We're going to do season three, episode four. The Killer Within. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out. <laughs>